Good afternoon, everybody. I want to let everyone know we will be beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. For this presentation, we will all be on listen-only mode. When the presenter is done, we will be taking questions, comments, or concerns via questions that you could type in on the right-hand side in the panel. Also, you'll find on the right-hand side handouts from today's presentation, as well as other information brought to you by the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Once again, this presentation will be in listen-only mode. At the end of the presentation, on the right-hand side, you could type in questions. Also, you will find the handouts. We will be beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you all to Care Connection. Before we begin, I just want to go over a little housekeeping. For the duration of this presentation, we will be in listen-only mode. On the right-hand side, on the control panel, at the end of today's presentation, you will have the opportunity to type in your questions, comments, or concerns under questions. In addition, on the right-hand side, on that same control panel, we have included handouts from today's presentation. So today we will be beginning, and we have a very special guest speaker, Carrie Carpenter, who for the last two years has been performing in Dr. Bill Thomas's nationwide Changing Aging Tour. Prior to this, she worked with older adults living in long-term care in San Francisco. 
In 2015, Miss Carpenter traveled to all 50 states, living in a van, the culmination of which was founding a wellness center, Prosper. Ms. Carpenter has two blogs and recently published Healing Dementia. She has a master's in counseling psychology and wrote her thesis on the anti-aging myth in America. Today's topic, she will be covering how to be radically pro-aging and dementia positive. Kiri, please begin your presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Heather, and I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you, everyone who showed up today and is listening. Um, and like Heather said, please fill in your questions and comments you have as we go along. I'm going to be sure to leave time at the end because I want to make sure we talk about what you guys want to hear. Uh, to get us started, a little bit about me. As Heather said, my name is Kyrie, and I come to this work through a background in psychology. Um, when I was studying psychotherapy, it came time for us to do our clinical training. And at the time, I wasn't interested in aging the way that I am now, but I had this idea, I guess I felt a bit of ageism myself. I thought at the time that I was a bit too young, didn't have enough life experience to really be a good therapist. And so I thought of a life hack. I thought, hey, if I work with older adults and I listen to all their stories and I catalog everything that they did right and all of the mistakes that they feel like they made, I could make this great list of how exactly to do life. Um, I thought I had found a bit of a life hack. So I, when I started looking for places to do my training, I looked for places that would allow me to work with um, older people. And the place I found was in San Francisco and it was working in long-term care. And I got to work on my very first day and I was checking out my new clients' charts, and I noticed that every single one of them had a diagnosis of dementia. And most of them had had that diagnosis for quite some time. And it was right about then that I started to realize that this plan I had hatched wasn't going to be exactly what I'd expected. So I started spending time with my clients, and it definitely was not what I expected. I was not sitting and collecting details on how to best live a life. Uh, very few of my clients remembered my name, let alone, not that my name's easy to remember either, but let alone what we'd talked about last week, um, different things we were working on. What was interesting is you could think in this scenario that that might have been shaken for me, like, oh no, I'm already worried about not being able to be a good enough therapist, and now here I'm saying not even being able to do therapy the way that I was taught it. But something arose instead. I started to notice what was happening despite things not being the way I expected. And I started to notice that I was learning things that I couldn't learn in books. And I'd always really relied on books quite heavily to get me through the world. Um, as one of my clients put it, when she would see someone who she knew well, she would look at you deep in the eyes. She'd put her hand to her head and say, I don't know you here. Then she'd move her hand to her heart and say, but I know you here. And that is exactly what I was learning. I was sitting with elders living with dementia, being with them in their reality and in their life. And I was learning how to know people from my heart. I was learning how to live life from my heart and not just from my head. And that was the very beginning of what started to get me curious about why is our world so anti-aging? And what would a pro-aging perspective look like? And why do we fear dementia so much? And what could be learned from the experience of dementia? What could be learned from people experiencing dementia to really heal our world? And so that was the beginning of what has now been quite a long journey exploring this. Um, but I wanna give a bit of a setting for that as we start to dig in. So yeah, it was from that place that I really began to get curious about our world. And I really noticed that although, you know, I had all of those cultural norms of thinking that ageism gives us of not valuing older people, not valuing the experience of dementia, but spending time day to day really being with people living with dementia made me realize that there's so much there. We're going to dig into that more, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a setting of where I'm coming from as I started exploring all of this. Um, so I doubt it'll come as a shock, 
to any of you listening today, but have you noticed that America is anti-aging? I want us to start by really thinking about that. Um, anti-aging. The last time I checked, aging is something that happens from the day we're born until the day we die. Aging is really synonymous with living. And yet, there's a multi-billion dollar industry dedicated to being anti-aging. I've spent a lot of time researching aging in American culture and our anti-aging paradigm. And again and again and again, I came across this belief that if one could appear to not be aging, you guys know what that means. So if you could stay physically fit, if you could stay cognitively sharp, if you can get your wrinkles erased, you know, the what Dr. Bill Thomas calls the tyranny of still, if you can still water ski barefoot at 103, you know, if you can appear to not be what we consider aging, then you can actually stop the aging process. And this is actually backed up by research um, that there is a big myth that is believed by people that we really believe that if we can appear to not be aging, we can stop the aging process. But do we really want to stop the aging process? This is something in my research I noticed that we go around the world trying to stop the aging process. You know, we buy the face creams, we do the brain exercises on our phone, we exercise, we eat right diets, which not all of those things are always bad, but we do them out of this belief that if we can appear to not be aging, we can actually stop the aging process. And yet I wonder how many of us have actually thought if we want to stop the aging process. If we go back to what we were just talking about, how aging is synonymous with living. Then to be anti-aging is to be anti-living, which is the very definition of death. When you look at the root of so much of our fear around aging, it really gets back to our fear around death and our denial around death. So we're left with this interesting paradox that to be anti-aging is to be anti-living, which is death, which is the very thing that we're trying to avoid with all of this anti-aging stuff to begin with. So why on earth <laughs> would we do this? Why do we keep staying in this paradoxical cycle of trying to prevent something that's inevitable, trying to stop something that isn't really the outcome we want anyways. None of us want to be anti-aging. I don't believe so. You know, we want to be living our life to our fullest. So why does this happen so much? Because the anti-aging movement is very, very profitable. Aging is something that happens to each and every one of us every single day that we are alive. So if you can make a market for products to stop a process, which is impossible in the absence of death, as we've said, to stop, it makes for a pretty solid industry. But what this comes down to is when we think about anti-aging, it makes a whole bunch of sense for selling stuff, for a marketing executive, for corporate America, but it really doesn't make sense for people. Because what anti-aging does for a person is tells you that you're not supposed to be doing something that every single one of us does every day. And it sets us up for failure in that way because there's no way in the absence, like we've said, of dying that any of us will be able to stop aging. And yet, all of these products and tools and things are marketed towards us. And so it's this really bad, vicious cycle where we're set up and feel like we're failing for aging. Culturally right now, there is a lot of talk about diversity, which is super awesome. Um, there's a lot of changes being made and people are really standing up for who they are and what we need to have happen. And many of us are f becoming more and more familiar with diversity factors, such as ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. But did you know that age is also a diversity factor? This isn't just my idea. If you look at the latest stuff on diversity research, um, it is listed as one of the main diversity factors. A really great model for that is Pamela Hayes' addressing model for age, and the, it's an acronym, addressing. And the very first one there, that A, stands for age. 
So what does it mean for something to be a diversity factor? It means that there's a group of people who have more power culturally and a group of people who are disempowered because of a certain facet of themselves. So when we think about this with age, there's a group of people who have more power culturally because their age and a group of people who have less power because of their age. Just like gender or religion or ethnicity, we judge people and we treat them differently based on their age. And you guys might already know this, but this is called ageism. It's easy when you're thinking about diversity to determine which group of people have the power because when we think of them, when we think of the factor listed, we'll think of the group of people that are disempowered. So for example, if you think of sexism, who do you think of? Probably women. When you think of ageism, who do you think of? Maybe older adults. Maybe you think about times when you were younger and maybe you were just told you were too young to do something. And if you think back, how, when have you ever been told that you weren't the right age to do something? Were you too young? Were you too old? That's age discrimination. That's ageism. What gets sticky about ageism is just like we said that frequently people get told they're too young and sometimes too old to do something. So it kind of cuts both ways. Um, ageism is largely unconscious right now in our culture, although there are a lot of great advocates spreading more, aware, you know, more awareness around this. And age is really multifaceted in that there's two facets to it, chronological and perceptual. When we think about that, there's your chronological age. You know, the day you were born, how many days have passed since then, how many years old are you? And then there's also a perceptual component. When someone looks at you, how old do they think you are? Aesthetically speaking, the dominant age in our culture, when I say dominant, I mean the age that is most valued based on appearance is in the late teens to early 20s. You don't have to take my word for it. Literally open any magazine, look at any ads, look at who's cast for certain roles. We really value the way people look when they're in their late teens and early 20s. And we give people power based on that appearance. Chronologically, power lies more in our 40s. That's the consciousness that as a culture we want people to have. You've had enough life experience to be really competent and good at your job, but you know not too much to be out of touch, as they would say yet, and also not too much, I would say, to know your value to ask for really what you deserve. So the last time I checked, there's no 19-year-old bodies walking around out there with 40-year-old consciousnesses, which makes ageism really, really sticky. So not only do we have this ageism that pits people against each other, but no one actually fits our ideal for that diversity factor, which makes it really hard, but also makes it really good because we can all relate to ageism. We've all been told we were too young or too old to do something. We've all been judged based on how old we appear about whether it was okay for us to do something or not, which means that ageism is a really great diversity factor to rally around. It can be a really great connector. It can be a really great starting point for intersectionality. Intersectionality meaning that when one or more diversity factors come together, they compound each other. So for example, you know, we think about sexism, women, are the group that's not in power. But then if you add sexism and ageism, um, an older woman is going to have even less power than a younger woman. But that intersectionality works the other way too for raising consciousness. So we can all rally behind our experiences of being discriminated against based on age and help raise consciousness about ageism and other diversity factors along the way. So what's happening here is not only do we have this multi-billion dollar anti-aging paradigm being thrown at us from day to day, we have ageism, which creates a really insidious mix. What's ended up happening is that aging has become a shadow of our culture. Now, when I use the word shadow here, I'm using it in the language from the depth tradition of psychology. So depth psychology, which was a tradition started by Carl Jung. Um, and when we say shadow in this context, we mean a part of us that remains unconscious. So parts of us that we don't know are in us. You can see in the diagram here too, we have persona and shadow. So our persona is that mask that we show to the world. Everything that we, who we show the world we are, the parts of us we really know about 
and share and the shadow is the part of us that maybe we don't know about yet or we choose to hide. And what happens in a person also happens in a culture. So when we think about our cultural persona, what we're showing to the world and what we're hiding, we can start to see that aging is really hidden in the shadow of our culture. Sometimes the shadow or aspects of us that we reject, that we say like, oh no, that's not me. And sometimes there are parts of us that we just haven't yet discovered. And I think aging is a little bit of both of those. There's definitely some major rejection of aging and pushing it into the shadow in our culture. But on the other side of that too, there has been a lack of awareness around really digging into embracing aging and seeing how we can hold it. So this word shadow is used because this facet of us, whatever we're talking about, in this case aging, is hidden as if in, you guessed it, a shadow. And it's not seen, but it is very much there. We have taken aging and we've put it in the shadow of our culture. You can see this physically manifest in all of the places we have to put people who have this so-called problem of aging. Starts with 55 plus communities, independent living, nursing homes, CCRCs, SNFs, you know, the variety seems to grow annually. And I wanna be clear that uh, this is not a critique on the amazing people who work in these places, but this is a critique on the fact that why did our culture even decide that we needed to segregate based on age in the first place? Um, and also they make us, it seem as if aging is something that only happens after we hit 55. But I don't know anyone who made it to 55 without aging along the way. So we're taking this aspect of our culture aging and we're hiding it and we're making it unconscious. And so part of this hiding it, like I said, is by being highly, highly age segregated. You can see that like I just talked about in the example of long-term care, but you can also see it in the fact that throughout all of our schooling years, we're put into a grade with people who are exact same age. Yep, this makes sense for efficiency, but it doesn't make sense for us having connection across diversity lines, across age lines. And just like across other diversity factors, we've had to fight against segregation and name that it's better for us to be with people who aren't necessarily like us. The same goes for aging. It's time for us to pull aging out of the shadow to you know, stand up against age segregation and make sure that we start to blur the lines and have people of all ages involved in all things. Um, we push aging into the shadow in lots of other ways too. If you look at movies, um, very rarely are older or younger people given complex character roles. You can look at the ages of people who are given certain roles. You know, you'll have a mother and children who in real life are only a couple years apart but are playing mother and daughter on the screen. Um, all sorts of different things. I and mean, take a minute now and just think about the ways that we try to hide aging in our culture, to push it into the shadow. There's so, so many. So again, in the tradition of depth psychology, there's a special element that comes into play when we push something into the shadow. And that is called the trickster. The trickster comes in and upsets the status quo. But this upset becomes a setup for personal growth and change. The trickster you can see in all kinds of stories. It's always that character that sort of comes in and you think everything's falling apart, but then everything falling apart really sets the building blocks for things being built back up. So when I was looking at aging and getting really curious about why the heck do we hate it so much to begin with, I noticed that the trickster, when it comes to aging being in the shadow of our culture, and so again, the trickster comes in when something's pushed into the shadow, it's time for us to integrate it, the trickster shines a light on it by upsetting things. The trickster, when it comes to aging, is dementia. Dementia highlights everything we fear most about aging and old age. And we are pretending, as a culture, that it doesn't exist. We cloister it away in large buildings with fluorescent-lit hallways. We medicate it away with antipsychotics when dementia gets too loud and it has behaviors that don't fit the way we think an older person should act. Suddenly, when someone doesn't act like the stereotype of you know, a quote unquote grandma knitting and saying nothing, break out the antipsychotics, put on the chemical straitjacket, make even more profit off of rejecting aging. We can't have people over a certain age making any noise 
reminding us that they exist, that aging exists, that we are all aging right here, right now. This dementia is common and has played the trickster and you know, there's so many organizations that are doing so much, the Alzheimer's Foundation included, to help us figure out better care practices, to help us find cures and all those things. And I think that all of that really has to start with viewing dementia as this trickster that's coming in and showing us something that we have to learn. And just like in fairy tales when, you know, the hero finally can figure out what they need to do, I think dementia is showing us a path for embracing aging and for really healing our culture's obsession with youth. And I recognize that what I've said so far may be preaching to the proverbial choir. Um, this problem is finally being recognized and gaining a lot of traction. And it's starting to become less of a radical idea to be radically pro-aging and dementia positive. Uh, and on top of that, there is still rampant ageism in America and beyond. So I wanna offer a little bit of a reframe we think when we think about aging and dementia, a lot of times we think about the suffering associated with them. I want to be really clear that I am well aware of the suffering that comes with life in general. And I know that aging, especially in our culture, is not easy. And the experience of living with dementia is not easy. And there's a lot of suffering. What I want to add to that is this idea that even more suffering is piled on top of that when we reject aging. Yes, there is suffering in life, and this is natural. But rejecting aging increases the suffering and robs us all of the resources that aging has to offer. And it was this perspective shift that really set me on the path of becoming radically pro-aging and dementia positive. Can I hold the realities of suffering, but look for what else is there? Can I look for what would happen if we didn't reject aging. So how do we do this? What is the solution to this suffering if rejecting aging is the problem? Accepting it, maybe even embracing it. And that's what we're gonna be doing here today. We're gonna to be practicing embracing aging. You guys may have noticed um, quickly on the first slide, I call myself a crone in training. Because that was the big belief that I came to with my research was that so much suffering comes from rejecting aging, from ageism, from being anti-aging. And that is something that we can change. We can't change the realities, you know, the other suffering. But the suffering that comes from rejecting aging, we can change. Fear is preventable. Aging is inevitable. So how do we embrace it? A place to start looking is to start looking at all the things that the anti-aging world values. Then if we can start cultivating the opposite of that, it'll help us show what aging has to offer us. For example, reason versus intuition. Our anti-aging world loves reason and cognition. Um, and dementia researcher Tom Kitwood says this is because it's easy to measure. It's really easy to give someone, a bunch of people, a standardized test to measure them against themselves and each other. It's much harder to measure someone's intuition, their way of being, the value that they offer in things that aren't quite cognition. But aging and dementia teaches us to value those things. So what I did when I was getting curious about this is as I was reading about aging, as I was sitting with elders, I started to make a list, a list of things that I noticed our anti-aging world didn't value like intuition um, versus something that it did value, like reason, that aging showed us how to embrace. And so as I sat and I looked at my list, I waited for salient themes to emerge. And I realized that embracing something that's in our unconscious, that's hidden by our culture, is pretty difficult to do. And that we really need a system or a reminder to embrace aging to look forward and combat the ageism that lives inside of us and outside in our culture. Because culture change starts with people changing. And challenging ageism and the anti-aging paradigm starts by illuminating our own shadow of our own internalized ageism. And that's why I talked about being a crone in training. That's my little reminder every day. How can I cultivate the crone that I want to be someday? As I was doing my research, what ended up becoming my thesis 
um, I came up with an acronym, PLAY, and we're going to get into those so that you guys can play and practice at home after the webinar. But before we get into what PLAY stands for and all the PLAY method can be, I want you guys to know that all the PLAY, the PLAY method, as I call it, is a place to start. PLAY stands for four different categories of things I noticed that aging teaches us that our anti-aging culture rejects. And it's meant to be a starting block to help jog your memory so that you guys can start churning and listening and coming up with your own things and adding to this movement. It's just an easy way to remember things which aging is teaching us, which our culture doesn't value. And then please, please, please expand from there. The acronym PLAY is also an energetic reminder of the perspective from which to view combating ageism. When we play, we practice for a life without fear or failure. Think about when you were a child and you would play. There was no fear of failure. You were just trying stuff out, experimenting, exploring. Um, try new things and be fully unrestrained. This is the attitude I want you to bring to the work we'll do today. A playful, non-judgmental attitude towards yourself and to the world. Okay, so what does play stand for? P stands for pacing. Now, in our culture, we get told all the time that faster is better. More productivity, you know, with emails, we're available 24-7 on our smartphones. I don't think it comes as a shock as anyone that we are constantly pushed to do things faster. And there's starting to be a little bit of a pushback with that. There's a slow food movement and stuff. Um, but aging and people living with dementia have taught me that faster is not always better. So the P stands for pacing, which doesn't necessarily mean to go slowly. What it means is to find the right pace for each thing. So if, you're, um, if you are able, I want to invite you guys to do a little bit of an exercise with me so you can feel what I mean. Um, so if you're able to stand up and sit down safely where you are, I'm going to ask you to stand up and sit down a couple times. If you're not in a place where you can do that, you can do the same exercise by raising or lowering your arm or by blinking your eyes, as I indicated. Okay. So for those of you that are in a place where you're able, I want to invite you to stand up or raise your arm or open your eyes. And I want to invite you to sit down as fast as possible. Just sit. And then see how that felt. And stand up again. And I want to invite you to sit down as slow as you possibly can. You'll be doing it right if your thighs are burning before your bottom hits the chair. And one last time, stand up again and sit down at your normal pace. And that pace is going to be different for every single person who's sitting down because faster isn't always better for sitting down. And it's a really good energetic way to feel there's a right pace to sit down. There's a right pace for doing all things. Um, and when we're thinking about practicing, like I said, the come, becoming a crone in training, to become radically pro-aging, we want to practice stuff. So I really invite you guys to think about your day-to-day -day life and where you could practice pacing. You know, could you, stairs are a fun place to pa practice pacing, going upstairs fast, slow, and just right. Um, there's all sorts of different places. Think about something that would integrate in your life where you can just get this felt sense for what is the right pace for different things. And then that felt sense will bleed outward so that you start to notice what's the right pace for you to go throughout your day, to go throughout your work. What's the right pace for a conversation with a certain person to really start to cultivate that sense for pacing. Like I said, when I was sitting with elders living with dementia, cannot tell you how many times a day I heard slow down, either directed at me, my speech can get pretty fast and I can race around, or directed at other you know, care professionals. And I, I get why things get sped up, but I think we could learn a lot from those little reminders to slow down a bit. So P stands for pacing. Like I said, it's not hard to see that America values a past pace. And it's also not hard to see that aging teaches us not only to slow down, but a discernment for the best pace for a given moment. L stands for life story. Uh, our culture teaches us that our life story is housed in degrees, homes, resumes, 
Twitter followers, LinkedIn connections, awards, all sorts of things like that. So often, even at cocktail parties, the first question someone asks is, what do you do? But aging teaches us that our life story lies in character. And the forgetful and disinhibitory aspects of dementia can be a great teacher for life story. When we forget about those resume details and those awards and all of those things, our hand is forced to look at what is there when we don't remember our life story the way we've always told it. What is the force of our character that remains below the story and in fact becomes more prominent as we age? With life story, it's thinking, you know, we there's a lot of talk to in the dementia world. We wonder why music works so great. Because music speaks to that heart, like I mentioned in the beginning, not to the head. Music speaks to that, and I'm not talking about the science of music, I'm thinking more on a psychological level here too. It speaks to that deeper part of us, not that part of us that has all of these accomplishments and has done all of these things, but the feeling part of us that has moved through the world and lived a life and has a life story that could never be housed on a single sheet of paper or a website. And so I wanna encourage all of you in your interactions with older people, particularly those living with dementia, to look for the life story that is there that transcends the details. And to also know that that life story is being written every day that we are alive. So often when we hear the stories, particularly of people living with dementia, and in old, for older adults in general, we hear all about who they were and what they've done, and the story stops with, and then they were diagnosed with dementia. But that isn't what I've seen as the case. The story continues and the value continues for people living with dementia far past diagnosis. Um, and finding that value can help us see the parts of us that are valuable that aren't those parts that the world has taught us to value. Like I said, those you know, resume builders and square footage of your house, things like that, those deeper parts of our story. So L is for life story. A is for aesthetics. Um, when we think about art, we value, art is valuable. We all know art's valuable, right? When you look at a museum, paintings are worth billions of dollars. When we think about productivity, art is pretty useless. And yet we ascribe this great value to it. And I wanna take that same idea of ascribing great value to something and when I say useless, I mean does not have a productive use. Um, I wanna take that same value and apply it to our own appearance, to regard our own appearance and the appearance of others more deeply and more meaningfully. What if we valued our own aesthetic like art, not looking for one type of beauty and whether we fit it or not, but allowing for a widening of aesthetics? I put a picture of myself on this slide and I want you guys all to if you have a phone or something nearby, look at a picture of yourself if you can. And notice what's the first thing you think when you look at a picture of yourself. For most of us, it's a critique. We wish we looked a little bit of a different way than we do. But I, what I wanna offer as a practice for aesthetics is to look at a picture of yourself and appreciate it the same way you would a painting. To notice the texture, the curves, the colors, and rather than judging them for being where they are, or what they are, to just notice and appreciate them as they are. And again, I included this picture of me because I'm the exact same way. I could really easily look at this picture and completely pick it apart for how I don't quite like, you know, how my hair is or whatever. I'm not going to go into all the things because I'm trying to not teach my brain. But believe you me, it's not easy for me to look at this picture of me. But what I can do instead is start to notice something like art, start to notice that I like that there's a light in my eyes, that you can see that I'm smiling. I hope it comes across that I really love connecting with people and finding joy in the world and I'm in nature, which I love. And so noticing things like that about pictures and starting to question, why is smooth skin better than wrinkled? We don't judge trees for the wrinkles in their bark. Why do we judge human faces for the wrinkles of their skin? Why is blonde or brown or red hair better than gray? These are all superlatives that our culture has told us are true. 
and these are value judgments we make, but if we look at them objectively, they just don't hold up to scrutiny. Another great practice for widening your view of aesthetics is to look at art, especially around age, is to look at art from older adults. Um, there's some amazing artists out there who have done beautiful paintings and portraits of older adults. And if you can, rec if you can recognize that those pieces of art are beautiful, how come we can't recognize that the subjects of them are? So A is for aesthetics. Looking at ourselves and each other as art, not for one standard of beauty, not for that 19-year-old smooth skin aesthetic, but to recognize that that is beautiful and so is a 90-year-old face covered with wrinkles that show where someone has been. And this is a practice we need to do every day. I really encourage you guys to, anytime you see a photo of yourself, to notice what your first thought is and then to practice appreciating that photo of yourself like art. Y stands for your perspective. In America, as we sort of, as we talked about earlier, we value cognition. And cognition, you know, just being a funny word for how we think, the way we think that can be measured on a standardized test. And as I said before, it's really easy to measure, and so we measure it a lot. But there are so many other ways of knowing. And so why, for your perspective, is a reminder to join others in their reality. This is the main way I worked with people living with dementia. Um, getting really curious about what their world was like, not correcting them, not telling them that my reality was right, but just getting curious about the differences in our realities. Another way of looking at this is looking at different multiple intelligences and beginning to practice now valuing things other than just your cognition, valuing your intuition, valuing the way that you know things in your body, um, valuing the knowledge that can come from nature, valuing lots of different perspectives. So that is play, P-L-A-Y, P for pacing, L for life story, A for aesthetics, Y for your perspective. The most important thing that play does is it allows us to hold the realities of aging. There are a lot of things our culture tells us about aging that just aren't true. We do know that aging isn't easy and the play method doesn't eliminate the challenge of aging. What it does do is it allows us to unlock what I believe is the most important word in the fight to end ageism, the word and. Yes, there are harsh realities, sorrows and sufferings associated with aging and dementia, and aging offers us a tremendous opportunity for growth, joy, and character development. It's called growing old, for a reason. And I really encourage you all to get out there and play. And if you don't know how, make a friend with someone living with dementia and they will show you the way. Thank you, I'd like to take questions now. Thank you uh, for that wonderful presentation. Now we will be taking questions, comments, or concerns. Like I said before, you could type them in on the right-hand side. I have one question from Jill. Um, she's asking, how could I apply the play method to working in a facility on a dementia care unit? Yeah, absolutely. So I would be curious to know um, what Jill's role is, but I'll sort of do it from a diff couple different perspectives. So there's a bunch of different ways you could do this. If you're working in you know, activities or enrichment, you could think about what sort of things could you do to practice um, the different ones. So maybe it's you could practice pacing, doing you know a balloon toss game where you're throwing a ball slower and faster and finding the right pace. Um, for life story, you can engage with people through maybe making their playlist. You know, we've all heard so much about how music is helpful, but finding out what does someone's story look like through song. Um, you know, you might get some. There might be some trial and error of playing some songs from different time periods. You know, that person was alive and creating a little bit of a playlist for their life, starting from their early years up to the present of songs that they um, can share with you they really like. And they might not say, I like this song, but when you play the song, watching and attuning to them for those reactions. Um, you could look at art of older people with them and talk about how beautiful it is or what they see and how maybe they and then get mirrors out and try to do the appreciation. 
Um, so you could do it in an activities way, kind of like that. It's also something to hold just in your mind. So let's say you're a care partner working in memory care and you know you can try to remember where can you slow down. And I know there's a lot to get done, so there's not gonna be a lot of places, but finding those little moments for pacing where you can slow down, where you can sit with someone. Um, you can also use it to help talk to management about like, hey, you know, I have, you guys can find on my website, you can find my thesis. It's got all the references and things you need to, you know, quote unquote, prove this um, and run that up the flagpole to show management. Like, hey, if you see me sitting next to someone, I am actually doing a better job at my job than just completing the tasks because we're practicing pacing together and that's going to increase their well-being and you're still going to get all your stuff done. Um, but really learning from the elders and letting them guide you. And think about each of these perspectives, you know, each of those four facets and think about what they would want. And to the extent you can engage them in conversation. That's great. Thank you. And she said, thank you. That was a great um, response. I have a question from Daniel. He wants to know, how have you seen perceptions about aging and dementia change with the advocacy and education Maria Shriver has been doing? Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll speak broadly to that one too, yeah, both because I don't know how to quantify how what I've seen change is only attributed to Maria Shriver, but she's doing great work. Um, but it is cool in the, you know, I've been really active in this field for about five years now, really being radically pro-aging and dementia positive. And I, it's been really cool to see a lot more people gaining interest and with a lot of celebrities who are you know, getting older, it's been really helpful that a lot of people are really um, becoming more aware about the of this, and it's becoming the kind of thing where I get less glazed over of a look. Um, I'm also seeing people get creative. I'm really encouraged. I was just at the Eden Alternative Conference, and I'm really encouraged to see how, you know, even when I started this, I didn't think about how memory care was segregation from, you know, other care and how that really wasn't helpful, you know, how better outcomes can actually be achieved when we desegregate. And so seeing that there are these changes happening in long-term care where people are being, you know, where memory care is being desegregated, really seeing the boomers saying, hey, we want to do things differently. We're not going to go for the nursing homes that maybe our parents' generation did and coming up with just so many different alternatives of like co-housing movement. I guess I'm just seeing a lot of creativity out there and it's just showing up on, you know, news feeds and things more that there's definitely more awareness out there now and so I hope that that'll you know make a better quality of life for all of us young and old. Thank you. I have another question um, from Inger. She says I love a few specific examples of how to apply a pro-aging perspective with my parents both who have dementia. Hmm. Yeah okay so how to exactly so the very 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 first place to start is just is in that switch that and that dementia is a really really hard experience and look for what it can teach you so really the first thing i would say is to follow your parents lead um so when you're hanging out and i don't know you know i wish i could have a real conversation with you so forgive me for the assumptions i'm gonna have to make in this answer but when you're with them sit with them join in their reality so get curious about what time period they're in, what the world looks like to them. And um, I always say, listen with metaphorical ears, not literal ears. You know, so if somebody's talking about being in a different place or time than you know yourself to be in, listen for what that could be meaning metaphorically. Um, thinking about it almost like a poem, using that language like poetically. So if we're back in, let's take an example of, you know, war times, and then two, what does that mean? Is there some fear that's there or is there camaraderie that's being asked for? Um, so I feel like being really pro-aging is not saying, valuing it highly and saying it does matter and really getting curious about like, oh, you think that it's this year, what could that mean? Um, what does that mean to you? What does that feel like? And really following with them. I, I found, You. Carrie, you're cutting Over out. It. You're cutting out a oh, bit. Oh no. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I didn't move or anything. It must just be. Is that better yet? Much better. Much better. 
Um, but just really getting curious and playing Sherlock Holmes when there's something that would be called, you know, a behavior problem, really looking at it as an expression of need and getting curious metaphorically about what's going on, um, you know, in that way. I wish I could know more about your parents. I feel like I could give a better answer if it was more specific, but mostly it's just being with them, joining in their reality, trusting their um, opinions and trusting the experience of dementia to really show you guys how to be together um, and following what they're doing using the rules of improv. Check out improv theaters, rules, yes, and really going with them and seeing where that takes both of you. Um, and feel free to, my website's up here, to reach out to me with more specific questions via email and stuff. I love, happy to chat with anyone. Thank you. A follow-up question from Inger is, uh, I'm, she's uh, also struggling with the shift from support to care. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, Inger, that's a question that we would be happy to help. And for any other um, participants, we have our helpline seven days a week, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturday, Sunday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. You certainly could call our helpline and any of the licensed social workers would um, love to help you kind of strategize some uh, uh, interventions uh, to help you with your parents. But of course, um, you could take a stab at the answering this right now, but you could always uh, give us a call on our helpline. Yeah, I would say definitely call the helpline so you can get really individualized um, help. On a broad level, I think you bring up a really good point of that switching from yeah, really, I would just encourage you to get the support and help you need. Far, far too often I see family care partners trying to do everything and feeling guilty when they can't. So to the extent that I can just say, get all of the support and help you can. We are not meant to age alone. We're meant to age in community. And, you know, our culture isn't set up right now to have those structures in place. And so we need to really we have to reach out and really pull for it and organizations like the alzheimer's foundation have a lot of those resources can help you get connected with those and i would just say early and often connect 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 get as much support as you possibly can and know that getting support is is a success not a failure exactly thank you um, we have from Laura Mateo. She greatly enjoyed your presentation. She said, I learned many new things about the perception of aging in an anti-aging society and how to improve the acceptance of it um, as many uh, pieces and uh, many patients. And she wants to thank you. She really loved your presentation. Thank you so much. And please, please stay in touch. Um, yeah, I, I love this stuff. I talk about it all the time on yeah, through blogging and social media, and I love connecting with people. There aren't, you know, it's a growing group, but we're still a small group. So thank you so much for that. So I have a question from Jane. Uh, she is a social worker, and she happens to work with individuals with young onset Alzheimer's. And, you know, for the presentation, she her perception was you were talking about older adults, you know, older as in over age 65, what about the person who's in their 30s and 40s with this mm -hmm. disease and the anti-aging movement? How does that play in on how they get help and how are they perceived? Yeah, that, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, it does. it is easy to end up um, speaking mostly about people over 65 in this. And thank you so much for bringing that up, Jane. Um, it gets compounded, right? Because now when we're talking about that perceptual part of aging, someone's going to look at those, you know, individuals, and they're going to assume that they fall into a certain category, and yet their experience is going to fall into the other one. So I think it's even compounded and harder because not only because we also assume that only older adults experience these. So thank you so much for bringing that up, Jane. That's a really good point. You know, so dementia is a really big intersection of ageism and ableism. And when we don't look like we're older, but maybe you're experiencing this, it can help, it can be really hard for that diagnosis to get taken seriously, to get the supports and helps that we need. Um, so absolutely, I wanna say, yeah, both for, for younger onset dementia and for all sorts of, it extends out so quickly, right, into other forms of differing abilities and other mental health concerns, really taking this perspective of valuing 
every individual for who they are and their experience. And it works for all of us, not just those of us living with dementia, no matter what age we are. Thank you. That was a really great response. Um, and so uh, at this moment, we don't have any further questions. Unless anyone else has any questions or comments, um, please do type them in. I know you have a book. Um, do you want to tell people about your book, Healing Dementia? Sure. I'd, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I have a book. It's available on Amazon. It's called Healing Dementia. Um, and it's it's a lot of what we've been talking about today. It's, it's a very... Um, it's a picture book designed for adults. It's designed to be able to be flipped through and you could talk about the imagery. So it's designed to be accessible to people even um, who have been living with dementia for quite some time. Uh, it's also designed to help those of us who are not living with dementia to move towards embracing it. So the book tells the story of our consciousness um, from an early age through and sort of offers a perspective of what would it happen exactly what we're talking about today what happens if we embrace aging and if we embrace the way our changes in our brain happen what happens if we embrace all ways of knowing um, it takes it's a really fast read it takes me about four minutes to read it out loud when I do it in presentations so it's designed to be the kind of book that can be sat on a coffee table or in a waiting room that can be flipped through to really spark conversations about like hmm what could we value about dementia and how can we look at the experience of dementia to help us heal our world that, like we've said, is so anti-aging, so cognition-obsessed. Thank you. I actually have one more question from Luann. Sure. Uh, she is actually really interested in everything you're doing, and she wants to know present day what you're uh, currently involved in in terms of research and training. She's just really curious because she likes what you're doing and what you presented on today. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm doing all sorts of things. Um, I'm just sort of that type of person who I like to have a lot of different things going at once. So I'm actively working with Dr. Bill Thomas um, in a couple ways. I'm working with his latest startup, Minka, which is a system for building mostly compact, but they could be big homes that are designed to be uh, multi-age, multi-ability friendly. They're also really sustainable. You can check those out at uh, myminka.com. So I'm working with him on the community development side of that. So it's something we call magic, multi-ability, multi-generational inclusive communities. So I've been doing a lot of trainings and stuff around how to create communities that are multi-ability and multi-generational with that team. Through that partnership, we're working with the University of Southern Indiana, who are doing some really exciting things to really pilot magic. I've been teaching a class there with one of my other team members, and we're doing a lot of really cool, um, research and different things through the University of Southern Indiana. Then with Changing Aging, I'm still part of the Changing Aging Tour, which um, communities bring, you know, we've been doing it a lot in partnership with conferences and stuff. So we, whenever a community wants us to be there, we sort of show up and we do, it's two shows, Disrupt Dementia and Life Most Dangerous Game. We have a swing coming up, hopefully, I think in New Jersey and um, Pennsylvania in the fall, as well as one in Illinois. We just did one in Atlanta last month. Then I'm also doing some different keynotes for different organizations and workshops as those pop up. I'm working with Ashton Applewhite um, on a resource clearinghouse for anti-ageism tools. So be on the lookout for that. She'll be posting about it. If you don't already follow her, so will I. That's called Old School. Uh, which will be just a clearinghouse for all sorts of resources, anti-ageism. And then let's see about, and then I'm working with a tech startup called Nurture Co., which is a care coordination platform that has some really exciting um, wellness and self-care stuff built in, practices for both elders, care professionals, and family members. Um, I'm working with them. I think those are all my things. And then writing. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh wow! So uh, you fit a lot of a lot of stuff in in a in a day's time. I bet I, I she loves everything that you're doing, and she's a big supporter of you and Ashton, and uh, she was excited to listen to you today. So that's amazing. And um, 
We've had other people comment how great today's presentation were, was rather. Um, we will be wrapping up today's uh, presentation. I want to thank you um, for your wonderful uh, presentation and all the great questions we had from our participants. I want to welcome everyone back. Uh, we do have a special edition Care Connection happening on June 4th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We have Dr. Nancy Hodgins. And she's going to be doing a special edition Care Connection webinar on impact and tips for dementia-related sleep disturbance. So I hope you could all join us back uh, on June 4th. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you so much for volunteering your time and expertise today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I look forward to hopefully being in touch with you all in the future. All right. Bye. Bye.